live now <laughs> perfect good evening everyone welcome to karwan i am ishan sharma and with me i uh, have uh, professor ishtia kahmat author of a wonderful book called jinna his successes failures and role in history and we are continuing the second uh, lecture of the same series on partition and freedom and uh, today's title is partition and game we are going to talk about the role of four important uh, leaders or characters of our history nehru gandhi jinnah and mount batten professor ishtiaq ahmed uh, is a swedish political scientist and author of pakistani descent he holds a phd in political science from stockholm university where he is currently professor emeritus he is also an honorary senior fellow of institute of south asian studies at the university national university of singapore and he is also the editor in general of the liberal arts and social sciences institute journal uh, he is a member of the editorial advisory board of asian ethnicity journal of punjab studies ipri general islamabad and pips research journal of conflict and peace studies islamabad so truly an honor hosting you for the second time in this series over to you thank you very much ashan uh, it was very nice talking to you last time uh, you know the topic we have chosen today the partition end game mount batten jena nehru and gandhi uh, i realized that the background from the time where we stopped 1942 the quit india movement until mount batten comes is equally important because unless you fill in that period mount batten and what happened subsequently would be very difficult to appreciate or make sense of so i will as i did last time begin with a background presentation of the events uh, post quit india movement the quit india movement effectively put the congress leader leadership in jail not only the main leaders but even uh, cadres of the party and uh, it was virtually gone from the political scene now in for such a situation to obtain that's ideal uh, the field was left completely uh, you know unoccupied to the all india muslim Uh, uh league to propagate its mission that the in in the salvation of the indian muslims the creation of pakistan was central jina sahab i'm not going to quote his speeches now as i did last time because you already know the way he argued his case that hindus and muslims are two antagonistic nations to put them together in one state is a recipe for disaster so the best is to give them separate states and that would create conditions of peace between two neighbors now we all know that didn't happen uh, it was an argument uh, which was questionable because any scheme for partition would leave minorities in substantial numbers in the wrong state unless part of the whole game was a total exchange of population all hindus in india all muslims in pakistan and as we know that was never put on the table not by the congress actually the congress till the very end opposed the partition of india the muslim league and jena did mention a few times an exchange of population but realized that they were the main losers if that were to happen and the british didn't encourage that at all because they wanted to leave uh, india in a way where their strategic interests were best served let me i mean last time we didn't bring this factor in but it's important that during the second world war the british 
were under great pressure from the Americans to grant India its freedom. Uh, Churchill kept on telling President Roosevelt that in the in the British Indian Army, 2.5 million, 70 percent of the troops were Muslims. Now that was a white lie. About 38 to 42 percent, roughly, can be considered Muslim. Uh, so this was a lie, but and uh, Churchill told Mountbatten that Gandhi and uh, the Congress were pro-Japan uh, pro Japan, and uh, were basically fascists like the Japanese. Uh, the evidence we have on the American side is that they were not convinced uh, by Churchill, but during the war they had to go along because their own experience of Asia was limited. And uh, after 1941 December, uh, American troops were then posted in Guwahati and northeastern India, and some of them uh, in Bengal in different places. So that was the American experience. But their insistence was grant India freedom. Why did the Americans do it? Because partly it was part of their own anti-colonial struggle against the British. And it's only when the Cold War started that the Americans became a conservative force representing what is called the Western capitalist type of democracies. Before that, Americans were in favor of decolonization, first during the First World War and now again during the Second World War. And India was for them the most important colony that Britain should give its freedom. May I underline very strongly that Churchill at no point was keen to give India its freedom, but the war had placed Britain in a very uh, uh, exposed situation to the Americans. The Americans were paying their salaries, they were fighting their war, providing them with armament. Uh, so of course, Churchill was under great American pressure. Having said that, we now move to what happened in India. Remember, let me point out once again, this is important. On the 23rd, 24th of March, it's not an individual any longer, but a political party and a political movement demanding that India be partitioned to create Muslim states generically called Pakistan. I mean, it could be one state, it could be two states, one in Eastern and one in the Western zone, or several states in both zones, things like this. This was kept sufficiently vague because in 1940, it was not clear if the Muslim leaders from different parts of India would support just a division of India creating Pakistan in West and East Pakistan. They had to be brought uh, on board, you know. So this was the beginning. And I told you last time that within a week, there was a very strong opposition to it from the Sikhs. The leadership, the leaders, Sundar Singh Majitia, is on record saying that if you are going to have India partition, that in those areas of the Punjab where Hindus and Muslims constitute a majority, we would ensure that they are not brought under a communal Pakistan. So if you don't want to live with all other communities in a secular India of all Indians, and you want a Pakistan for Muslims, then we would demand a partition. And let me finally point out that until the 8th of March, 1947, the Congress was opposed to the partition of India. On the 8th of March, they supported the partition of the partition demand of the Sikhs. Later on, they, they supported the Hindu Mahasabha's demand that if Bengal, uh, Bengal should also be partitioned on the same principle, so that the Muslim majority areas are given to Pakistan and the Hindus 
majority areas given to India. We'll come to that much later, but I thought we have to bring this picture in the, uh, these things into the picture. So, uh, let, another important thing, at the Lahore session of the Muslim League, 23-24 March 1940, the hostage theory was uh, set forth. The hostage theory was that, that uh, in a partitioned India with Pakistan, uh, you know, several Muslim states, uh, a single state or two states, whatever, uh, there will be uh, minorities like Hindus and in the rest of India, given to the uh, Hindus, if you want to call it, there will be Muslims. So what would be the guarantees for the minorities, the hostage theory? Uh, if you go through my book, this is clearly stated by those who took part in the discussion on the Lahore resolution, that if Muslims are uh, put to trouble in India, then the Hindus and Sikhs in Pakistan would be held accountable. This was a medieval theory actually associated with the mafia. To bring it into the 20th century was quite a thing, but that's how the, Congre the Muslim League sort of justified the partition and some guarantees for minorities. Uh, Although we are going to talk more about uh, Mountbatten, the last Viceroy, we need to say a few words about uh, Lord Wivel, the pen ultimate Viceroy, the second large uh, last Viceroy. Uh, he was previously the commander in chief in the subcontinent. And during the Quit India movement, he developed uh, a great dislike, hatred for uh, the trouble which had been created because that strained his resources, you know, trying to control them. And he especially held Gandhi responsible for the troubles of the Quit India movement. He becomes the viceroy in 1943, in 43, yes. When he came, the last viceroy who was leaving, Lord Linlithgow told him, we are here for another 30 years. That would be 1973. I keep telling my friends, by that time I would have done my masters and maybe then left for Sweden. But this happened in 47. So we have to see how the British hand was forced what made them leave earlier than what they had said would be 30 years, not as the day of, depart of departing, but then they will reconsider how long they can hold on to India. But as we know, the hand was forced and they had to leave. Okay. In December 1943, a famous British journalist, Beverly uh, Nichols, he came to India and uh, wrote a book on his experience of India and talking to different leaders, where he dis described Jinnah as the most important man in Asia. And at that time, there was no basis for making such a claim because in the 1937 election, the Muslim League had been routed. So Jinnah could not claim in any sense that he represented all Muslims of India. But why he was portrayed by uh, Nichols in these words is because during the war, the Congress had gone into opposition, was not supporting the war effort. Jinnah was, and because of Jinnah's influence, the recruitment of Muslim soldiers continued. And the Sikhs were also recruiting soldiers, by the way. Uh, they didn't accept the Quit India movement. That is why in the Punjab, the Quit India movement didn't have much following. Two main communities were not in favor of it. Uh, and the Congress 
in Punjab was already divided into the radicals and the conservatives. We'll come to that later, okay? Nichols talked to Jinnah and uh, he said, wouldn't it be good that you have a united India where Hindus and Muslims and the rest can all live together? After all, the British have created this uh, new type of India. And Jinnah said to him, now remember the war was going on. Would you like to live under Germans? Or would you like to have your separate state? And saying this to an Englishman was rhetorically very effective. So then Beverly Nichol says, so what is your demand then? That we divide and quit? And Jinnah said, you have it right. So already another important thing, you know, people said that Churchill and Jinnah were in contact secretively uh since when we don't know but what we learn uh, is that when uh, churchill read uh, Be uh beverly nichols book he wrote a letter to his wife clementine uh, that he is now convinced that pakistan should be created remember he was then the prime minister of the war cap of the coalition government heading you know uh, fighting the second world war about churchill and the end game uh, sorry mahatma gandhi and the end game we will have something to say because during the negotiations he was absent uh, his great role was to save lives we come to that later so he was not in the negotiation process uh, except during the cabinet mission plan where he was consulted, but more as a private uh, statesman rather than as a spokesman for the Indian National Congress. You know, in 1934, he officially withdrew, but his influence and his following in the Congress was immense. So some people wonder what was this official withdrawal from the Congress and yet his great influence. Okay, anyhow, uh, 1944, Raja Gulapal Achari, Raja Ji, in, encouraged by Gandhi, and there is some understanding that Bevel was aware of all this, what was going on. He got in touch with uh, Jinnah, and uh, during the negotiations, the idea presented was that, okay, if you want Pakistan, then after the war, when the British are gone, we can hold a plebiscite in those parts of India where the Muslims want Pakistan. But the plebiscite would apply even to the non-Muslims in those territories to find out if they want to live in Pakistan or not. And if they didn't, then the understanding was that those parts will be separated from Bengal and Punjab, which were Muslim majority provinces and, and given to uh, India, you know. Uh, Jinnah rejected that proposal saying that, okay, after the war, we can have this, but the plebiscite would be only uh, for the Muslims to vote on whether they wanted Pakistan or not. The non-Muslims living in those areas where the Muslims were in a majority was not acceptable. Then the same negotiations continued with Mahatma Gandhi. And I think they met at least 14 times. Some people say for 18 times, some count 21 times. I've given the whole discussion uh, in quite uh, detail. Huh? Uh, uh, they exchange letters, they meet, uh, but it's a stalemate. They can't agree on, on this. Uh, the terms that Gandhi offers are the same as Raja Rajaji uh, offered. And Jinnah's 
position on both was of rejection. Yes, plebiscite, but only for Muslims in the Muslim majority areas. The non-Muslims have no right to vote. Now, this was illogical to say the least. Let me present this case. If the whole of India had voted on the Muslim minority getting Pakistan in those areas where the Muslims were in a majority, the northwestern zone and the northeastern zone of India, and there was no vote for the rest of the population of India on whether they want to grant Pakistan to the Muslims, then there was no chance Pakistan would come into being. So, if now the majority Hindu population and the Sikhs and the rest had no say on the Muslim League, Jinnah demand for Pakistan in those two zones where they were in the majority, whereas they were only a 25% minority in the rest for the whole of India, okay? Then there is no logical, no ethical, moral argument to deny the Hindus and Sikhs in the Muslim majority areas where they, that the Hindus and Sikhs were a majority. Let's say this is the northwestern and northeastern part of the subcontinent. These are overall Muslim majority areas, Bengal and Punjab, Northwest Frontier, Sin, whatever, okay? So if the Muslims are going to get Pakistan in this area, what about those districts and those parts of the Punjab and Bengal especially, where the non-Muslims were in a majority? So the Congress or the uh, uh, Gandhi position, Raja Gopal Achari, Gandhi position were perfectly legitimate, but Jinnah was not willing to concede that. Lord Wevel, who hated Gandhi and who had a soft spot for Jinnah says that this was a missed opportunity because a peaceful partition of India could have taken place based on this principle. And Bevel was supportive of it, but it is, it is Jinnah who rejected it, okay? I thought this is important because Gandhi thereafter is not key to the end game uh, uh, regarding the negotiations, except during the cabinet mission plan. Okay. Uh, Lord Wavell wanted to call a, a conference in Shimla where he would propose a national government. You know, the war ended in July, but already uh, earlier during the spring, it was clear that the Germans are going to lose the war. Uh, so the British were now preparing for a new type of relationship with the colonies. American pressure was there. Their economy had been shattered and they realized they can't hold on to the colonies for too long, beginning with uh, India. So he goes and lobbies with the British government and they agree to let him hold a Shimla conference where the idea was to form a national government with him, the governor general or viceroy as the head of government. This conference was called I think in June 1945, and it was wrecked by Jinnah. I have quoted Jinnah himself admitting that he wrecked it. Why did he wreck or destroy the chances of the Shimla conference? He insisted that only the Muslim League had the right to nominate Muslims to the executive that uh, the Viceroy wanted to establish after the negotiations. And the Congress insisted that they were a secular party and they had Maulana Azad, the president at that time of the Congress, taking part in, in the Shimla conference, but Jinnah would not shake hands with him and said, no, Congress can't do it. So the Shimla conference failed. Ahmed 
unlike Linlith Go, who had gone out with full force and crushed the Quit India movement, uh, Wavell, who was a military general, realized that Britain's ability to hold on to India was now greatly weakened. Why? Because during the war, there was this uh, Quit India movement, which had created quite an uproar, but also because there was the INA, which had been created uh, by Subhash Chandra Bose, fighting the British, not successfully, by the way. This INA was later on, many Indian soldiers were killed uh, once the Japanese forces became weak. But that's not the main thing we are discussing. On the 27th of December, 1945, uh, Lord Wavell announced, uh, prepares a secret, sorry, a very secret breakdown plan. What is the breakdown plan? The breakdown plan was a plan based on uh, the assumption that if British ability to roll, to hold on to India was no longer uh, uh, possible and they had to leave India quickly. What should they do? So the breakdown plan was a quick withdrawal of British uh, uh, personnel forces from the Indian subcontinent and transferring power to Indians. He said in the breakdown plan that the if that it was best if the Muslims remained within a loosely uh, uh, administrated federation uh, of India. But if they wanted Pakistan, well, let's grant them Pakistan. But then on the 7th of February 1946, he announces the demarcation plan. And may I tell you that the demarcation plan he announced was almost 99.9% .9 the same as the Radcliffe Award for Punjab and with a small variation, the same for Bengal. So what he had laid down became the basis of the final international borders between India and Pakistan. But these were total secret uh, plans the Viceroy had prepared and uh, sent to the British government telling them that we should announce them as the as our way of transferring power as an award. You know, an award cannot be questioned. You have to accept it. But the British government didn't do it. So we'll come to that. Uh, in 1945, July elections had been held in the UK. And despite Churchill being the prime minister who had won the war, the British people voted him out of office because Jenna, uh, Churchill was an arch conservative uh, and uh, Britain had been shattered. Its economy, its food supply, uh, everything was in a very bad order. And they voted the Labour government which promised radical reforms, creation of more jobs, uh, better food supply, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a, health, uh, uh, a national health service was also uh, announced, which the Congress, which the Conservative Party was opposed to. You know, they were the old type of uh, uh, reactionary uh, landlords and so on. Lords, okay. So when the Labour Party comes into power, it announces elections for India, both for the uh, federal type of sy system and then also for the provinces. And these, and then from August 1945, the election campaign was launched in the subcontinent. The Muslim League fought for Pakistan, demanding the partition of India. The Indian National Congress fought for a united India with an effective center. And the Sikhs of the Punjab fought for 
opposition to Pakistan, saying that if Pakistan comes into being, they will demand the partition of Punjab. The election results, I would talk mainly about uh, the Punjab province because that is where the trouble started. Out of 84, 84 reserved seats for the Muslims. Remember from 1909, Muslims voted for only Muslims to the assemblies and so on. Out of the 84 seats, 73 were won by the Muslim League. In the 1937 elections, the Muslim League, Muslim League had won only two out of these 84 seats. The, the, the Punjab Unionist Party, which was an intercommunal party of Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus, had won in 37. Now they were routed. They won only, I think, 16 seats. Why? Because during this election campaign, the Muslim League had campaigned on a very communal uh, uh, program. If you look at my Jena book and the Punjab partition book, I give the fortnightly reports of, reports of the governors of Punjab, Sir Bertrand Glancy mainly, and then later on Sir Evan Jenkins took over. Both reported that the Muslim League was using the communal card saying that if the Muslims don't vote for Pakistan, their marriages will be annulled according to Islamic rules and they would be denied a burial. Uh, they must vote for the Muslim League because voting for the Muslim League was voting for Islam and for the Holy Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad. If you voted for uh, the Punjab Unionist Party in the Punjab, for example, then you were vote, voting for Baldev Singh, the Sikh leader, and uh, Khizar Tiwana, the Punjab Unionist Party Muslim leader. So this is how they campaigned. And the result was just the opposite of the 1937 elections. They were also promised an end to the debts to the Hindu moneylenders. The Punjab peasantry and landlords were under debt uh, to Hindus. The same was the case in, in Sin, where also the Muslim League swept the elections. Uh, in the Northwest frontier, they didn't do uh, that badly. In 1937, they won no seat. Now they won 13. 17 was still won by the pro-Congress uh, Khudai Khidmat Gar party. So that's, they formed the government in the Northwest frontier. But anyhow, so now the thing is, the election result produces a polarized result. The Muslim League out of the total 492 seats, some say 507 seats reserved for the Muslims, you know, to the different uh, provincial assemblies, the Muslim League won 444, which is a massive win. The Congress out of 1,500 seats won 900 and something, which was also a major uh, uh, mandate for keeping India united. The six won all the 23 seats reserved for the Panthic parties, which were pro, which wanted a partition of the Punjab. So this polarization now meant that the, that the British had to take into account the ele election results which have produced on the one hand a mandate for Pakistan, on the, one, on the other hand a mandate for a united India, and if you look at the Sikhs, a mandate demanding the partition of Punjab, okay? So, in March 1947, the British sent a cabinet mission plan. It had three ministers uh, of the British cabinet. They came and they held negotiations with Indian leaders. I've given great details of those negotiations. I don't need to repeat here. But the important thing is that on the 4th of April 1946, when they spoke to Jinnah, 
Jinnah was given an ultimatum that either you accept a loosely united India with most powers belonging to the center, or they, he was told that you force us to leave India united, which would mean in the hands of the Congress. Jinnah on that occasion said, well, then if you want to do it, I can do nothing. But in the public, he went on saying that we will never reconcile to a united India of any sorts. We want a partitioned India to create a sovereign Pakistan with its own army, which means the division of the British Indian army as well between uh, the Muslim units going to Pakistan and the Hindu Sikh units going to India. The cabinet mission plan of 16th May 1946 proposed that India be grouped into three groups. Group A, the eight Muslim, Hindu, Muslim, uh, Hindu majority provinces. Group B, the Muslim majority provinces of Northwestern India, Punjab, Sindh and Northwest frontier. And uh, group C, which is Bengal. Uh, so, it also proposed that only uh, defense, foreign affairs, and communication were to belong to the central government. The rest, all residuary powers would be vested in the provinces. This is exactly what the Muslim League wanted. Okay. But the Muslim League had said that there should be two groups, A group, the Hindu majority provinces, and B group, the Muslim majority provinces of both East and West zones of, of the subcontinent. But in the cabinet mission plan, it was changed. Uh, one very important thing, the provinces were to, uh, sorry, the princely states were to uh, uh, be part of this union, but only by giving up defense and foreign services. The rest would be vested in the provinces. The Congress didn't want the princely state sort of entities to exist when India becomes uh, uh, independent. The Muslim League supported the independence of the princely states, okay? On the 25th of June, Jinnah finally accepted the cabinet mission plan. Uh, the Congress rejected it, saying that any self-respecting independent state would need an effective center. So there's a big controversy that if Jinnah, who was demanding partition all the time, actually at heart wanted a power sharing deal, which I've shown is a complete lie uh, there is no basis for it. It's the ultimate ultimatum served by the British that unless you can show us that Eastern and Western Pakistan can be can form a, def a, a defensible, in security term state, you leave us no choice but to leave India united. Uh, it is only then that he accepted the cabinet mission plan, but already created a problem for it. Uh, for example, the, the cabinet mission plan also had provisions for uh, a constitution for India. Uh, the, the Muslim League said that they will not take part in the constitution making process. They would rather make constitutions for the three groups and not take part in the union constitution making. The Congress said that although they reject the cabinet mission plan, they would go to the constituent assembly and make a constitution for uh, united India. So you already see that uh, the cabinet mission plan as a whole was not accepted either by the Muslim League and was not rejected as a whole by the Congress. This is very often forgotten, but I've given those details. 
the end result is that the cabinet mission plan failed. If you look at the book, I've given long chapters looking at British planning on India. They knew that they, are, they will have to leave India, but they wanted to leave it in a form that their strategic interests and their economic financial investments in India were safeguarded. And the general impression was that a united India uh, with a Congress government was unreliable. And this argument continued until we come into 1947 and Mountbatten, okay? Let me mention that uh, on 11th of May, 1946, the Supreme Commander of the subcontinent, uh, General Sir Claude Auchinleck, later made Field Marshal. He prepared a memorandum looking at should there be Pakistan or not? And he goes from pro and cons of Pakistan, concluding that uh, a partition of India would mean a partition of the British Indian Army, which was the uh, uh, prime sort of creation of the British to keep India united. To divide India would mean dividing that army and weakening the subcontinent uh, in, in defense, in defensive terms, vis-a-vis -vis external powers. And which external power they feared the most? They thought that Stalin and the Soviet Union would try to come to the warm waters and India with its great inequalities and caste system and so on would be easy bait for communism. So, uh, Lieutenant General Sir Francis Tucker, who was head of the Eastern Command, there were four commands, military centers of the British. He was head of the Eastern Command. He wrote in his book, while memory serves, that we need to create a, an Islamic arch starting from Algeria into Arabia, into Turkey, Persia, and Northern Hindustan. And in Northern Hindustan, a, sta a state armed with Islamic ideology and British sciences should be created, strong monotheistic Islamic ideology against the atheistic appeal of Soviet communism. So already arguments in favor of, of uh, creating Pakistan were existed at the higher ranks in the British army. Now, Mountbatten uh, tried to, still tried to create a framework for a loosely united India as proposed by the cabinet mission plan. So in uh, uh, July, 1946, he establishes an interim government inviting uh, Nehru to become the head of this government, but retaining himself the overall powers as governor general. There's a controversy about this also that uh, the, the cabinet mission plan had said that if any of the parties rejected the cabinet mission plan, the British would be free to go and ask the other party which accepted it to form the government. But now the British governors advised the vice, the viceroy that if the Congress was not part of the government, then India's peace could not be kept because it was the major party and the Hindu provinces would be uh, open to chaos and anarchy. So instead of the Muslim League being called, Jin, uh, Dehru was called to form the government, but he was advised to do all he could to bring the Muslim League into the government. Those negotiations 
I go into the detail. Finally, an interim government was formed and it lasted until about, I would say, uh, July 1947. Although it was never a proper cabinet, the Muslim League and the Congress ministers were working at cross purposes. Uh, anyhow, once the government had been announced, Nehru then on the 10th of July 1946 uh, gave a press conference in Mumbai, in Mumbai, in Bombay, where he said that the Congress will go to the Constituent Assembly free to make a constitution for India, uh, free to, to frame a constitution which was in the best interest of a united India with an effective center. And uh, Jinnah then said, look, the Congress is already uh, threatening the existence of the minorities in such a government. And then he gives a direct action call. And the direct action call then resulted in the great Calcutta killing from the 16th of August till the 18th, 19th of August in Calcutta. About 10,000 people were killed. Uh, initially, it seems that the Muslim League uh, had the and started the uh, uh, attacks, but the Hindu reaction took place almost immediately. Uh, after that, in Bihar, about five to 7,000 Muslims one-sidedly were killed, in which the Bihar Congress government was involved. Then in Noakhali, the Muslims attacked Hindus, and uh, anywhere from 500 to 5,000 are reported to have been killed there. In Mumbai, there were riots against Muslims where they were in a minority. Then it came to Gad uh, in the UP, where the riots apparently were over uh, not a communal issue, but a religious issue. We skipped that. Then the riots start in, in uh, against the Hindu Sikh minority in uh, Hazara district of the Northwest Frontier Province, which is on the borders of the Punjab in December 1946. In January 1947, Jinnah gives the call for direct action in, in, the, in, uh, in the Punjab, where there is a coalition government with Khizar Tiwana, the Congress and the six in power. And the Muslim League gives a call for direct action. The jails are filled. And on the 26th of February, direct action leads to uh, an agreement between the coalition government to release all Muslim leaguers while the Muslim League agitation will come to an end. But before that, on the 20th of February, uh, Prime Minister Clement Attlee made an announcement that uh, the that Britain will transfer power to Indians in a united or partitioned India by June 1948. So Sir Khizar Tiwana, who was a loyalist, British loyalist, he realized that in a future negotiations over India, it would be the Congress and the Muslim League who would be important. And his time was over. So on the 2nd of March, he resigned as the Prime Minister of Punjab. And that resulted in writing starting in the Punjab on the 3rd, 4th of March, which spread then to from Lahore to Amritsar, Multan, and Rawalpindi. In Rawalpindi, about uh, five to 7,000 Sikhs were massacred by Muslims. The Sikhs claimed 10,000 killed. The British records mentioned about 3,000 killed. Uh, in Multan, about 200 Hindus were killed. So these were Muslim majority districts 
in which these attacks were taking place, except Amritsar, where it was 47% Muslims, 53% Hindus and Sikhs. The rest of Punjab, Central Punjab, Eastern Punjab remained quiet until July, when attacks on the Muslim minorities in Eastern Punjab started taking place. Now, uh, in February 1947, when Clementine uh, Attlee announced that power will be transferred, they also recalled Wavell and said instead and sent instead uh, Lord Mountbatten. Mountbatten was royalty, and they were hoping that his royal aura and charisma, whatever you want to call it, would make it possible for them to transfer power according to British uh, interests. So now we come to Mountbatten and the rest. Mountbatten becomes the viceroy, the, the last vi viceroy, of, uh, viceroy of India on the 24th of March, 1947. He starts immediately negotiations, talking to Indian leaders across the board. And these continue over several weeks. He realizes that the cabinet mission plan was a non-starter now because the Muslim League wanted Pakistan, Congress wanted a united India. And so under such circumstances, uh, it was inevitable that India will be partitioned. So the, deciding that India will be partitioned in an official sense is that of Mountbatten. Although Mountbatten was a friend of the Indian National Congress. You know, there are so many complexities. One would expect Mountbatten to come and prevent the partition of India. But it's only he, when he becomes viceroy, that he decides that partition is the only solution. Uh, why? We will have to look at this. What were the circumstances? Yes. On the 12th of May, 1947, remember I said 11th of, of May, 1946, uh, Auchinleck had said no Pakistan. Why? Because it would mean a weak, weakened India, an invitation to the Soviet Union to come because the British Indian Army would be split. Now, on the 12th of May, the British Army comes to a diametrically opposite conclusion. The three heads of the British Armed Forces, Air Force, Army, and Navy, uh, the hero of the Second World War, Field Marshal Montgomery, and uh, Lord Ismay and several other people from the colonial office meet and they prepare a memorandum saying that if now India will be partitioned, we should welcome it because Mr. Jinnah has expressed an interest in remaining in the British Commonwealth. Whereas Hindustan may go its own way and decide to remain uh, uncommitted you know, have its own uh, uh, independent foreign policy, not become a part of the British-led bloc. The British were still thinking that they would be a major power, okay? And they say, and I've quoted that document, that uh, in Western Pakistan, we should demand from Pakistan Karachi port facilities, access to Pakistani airfields, and access to Muslim manpower. Muslim manpower means the Pakistan army. So that's when we find in May 1947, the British army also deciding that partition is good, create an Islamic Pakistan armed with Islamic ideology backed by British military and, uh, uh, you know, uh, sciences means 
you know uh armament huh? armament that's what the british are very good at euphemistic language okay they suspected that an india under nehru who was known to be a leftist and had leftists around him as prime minister would be unreliable will not take orders from london anymore now mount batten the friend of uh nehru yes and his wife allegedly having um uh, a relationship with nehru also i mean there's a lot written about it what does he do he talks to nehru and tells him look if you don't join the uh british commonwealth mr jinnah has expressed an interest in being part of the commonwealth and in in a case of war britain would be under would be treaty bound to support pakistan against india and nehru who was opposed to joining the commonwealth now was put in a corner and already patel and the rest had been convinced that joining the commonwealth was good not to have britain as an antagonistic force poised against them but to have their support as well so nehru gives in now then mount batten goes and speaks to jena and says mr jena i understand you want to join the commonwealth but remember if the if india doesn't join the commonwealth then under treaty we would have to support you in a war against india and that we can't afford because we can't have india uh, uh against us and maybe joining the soviet soviet union so remember your application may be rejected and jena says how can you reject the application of a people who have always been loyal to you we have never ever taken part in any protests and that is true the muslim league not muslims of india but the muslim league and those who supported it had never ever done anything against british rule rather after the second world war started jena supported the british against the congress all this is on record and jena was speaking the truth so what happens then is that uh, jena says i'll go to the british commonwealth and to the british people and protest so what had what had mount batten achieved he had made both nehru and jena decide to join the commonwealth once this was done this is my theory i think mount batten realized that it's best to transfer power quickly and leave because before the indian leaders change their mind so then he goes to britain talks to the prime minister and comes back with the partition plan let me admit that when he came back he had mentioned to nehru this partition plan and nehru he told that this is going to be the case so you keep quiet but the rest of the indian leaders were not informed until the afternoon of the 2nd of june where the partition plan was announced and mount batten records that everybody was shocked uh, and it would have been amusing if it was not the fact that uh, these leaders were in a state of shock and what was the shock about the three the plan was then officially announced in london on the 3rd of june and then in from delhi radio by mount batten where he said that we wanted to keep india united but realizing that this can't be done there will be a partition of india this is 3rd june partition plan after him spoke nehru saying that we had struggled for another type of india but uh, we accept the partition plan because this is not what we wanted but we accept it jena then speaks and says he thanks mount batten for accepting the partition idea 
third then uh Bill Dave Swing speaks for the six and he says that we also accept the partition plan which would what was the partition plan the partition plan was that two things that instead of june 1948 the date for the transfer of power was brought radically uh, forward to mid august 1947 less than 11 weeks from the 3 june plan if you look at the weeks and the days given for the partition a quick quick uh, 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 transfer of power and leaving it in a great hurry of course mountbatten established a number of uh, partition committees looking at the transfer of uh, assets of the colonial state uh, the division of the uh, armed forces the distribution of the military hardware all these committees were formed with mountbatten as the overall uh, head of these committees okay but the problem was it was assumed that all this will be done peacefully a major flaw in the plan was that uh, the that while the people would remain uh, put wherever they belonged the officials of the of the colonial state could decide to join either india or pakistan this is one thing the second was that the bengal and punjab assemblies would be split into two muslim majority and hindu majority uh, districts and for punjab the muslim majority and the hindu majority districts and if either block of the two provinces voted for partition these two provinces would be partitioned and the result Uh, on the twentieth, twenty-first of June, the Bengal Assembly voted for the partition of Bengal. The Hindu sec, the Hindu uh, uh, districts voted for partition. Uh, in the Punjab, the same. The Hindu Sikh districts, twelve out of twenty-nine, voted for partition. So now both provinces would also be partitioned. but was it going to be peaceful that's the the tragedy of the of the partition gandhi had been warning that this would be a bloody bloody affair it would be a blood bath the punjab governors were writing reports sir evan jenkins every fortnight that a blood bath was in the offing unless you give me 20000 british troops to monitor the partition he couldn't get it he was given about Seven to nine thousand volunteers from the in uh, from the uh, British Indian Army with a handful of British officers, and when they were given the task of maintaining law and order in twelve districts of the Punjab, they failed, and the partition itself turned out to be the bloodiest affair in the subcontinent, anywhere between. One million and more Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs were killed. Fourteen to fifteen million people were forced to leave their homes in search of uh, uh, safe havens across the border. Hindus and Sikhs to India, Muslims to Pakistan. But mainly, this happened in the Punjab, where the six million Muslims of East Punjab. had to run for their lives for west punjab and 4 5.5 million hindus from west punjab run for their lives to east punjab in the end there was complete ethnic cleansing in the punjab uh, in the rest of india in bengal the situation was not so bad because mahatma gandhi ensured that there was no communal riots there he sat on the 15th of august in calcutta with muslims and saved their lives whereas in 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 the punjab there was escalation of uh, uh 
you know, communal riots from May into June into July. Until July, it was all in West Pakistan, in the Muslim majority districts. Then it turned into the Hindu Sikh majority districts as well. So ethnic cleansing in Punjab, Bengal, the minorities remain, you know, although there were some riots later. In the rest of India, the Muslims were attacked in different places. The Hindu Masaba and RSS organized these attacks. There is enough sufficient evidence of it. Uh, but the Congress governments in the rest of India ensured that the Muslims, uh, if they wanted to remain in India, they could do that in peace. And if they wanted to leave for Pakistan, they could do that as well. Only 3% of the Muslims decided to leave India outside the Punjab and come to Pakistan. The rest stayed on in India because although the Muslim voters in 46 had voted for Pakistan, I, I, as I told you last time, it was only 11%. And these were elite Muslims who had the right to vote, people with property. Why did they vote the Muslims of the Hindu majority districts? This is suicidal. It doesn't make sense, but they did it because Jinnah forced them to make a sacrifice to create Pakistan. That's the end story of the partition. I think I end here now, my presentation. Thank you so much, sir. I hope I'm audible. Uh, I can't hear you. Just a moment. No. Can you now? Very little. Very little. Give me a moment, sir. I hope this can make it better. Now? Uh, is but it any better? Still bad. Still bad. Is it, is it better now? Yeah, now, 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 now. Finally, yes. yes. I'm really sorry for this. Uh, so, uh, sir, my question uh, to you after this such an illustrious uh, and amazing lecture that you presented on the end game, the partition end game, is uh, do, do you agree with the point that partition was made inevitable over these decades leading to, you know, after Lahore resolution to this 47? No, not at all. I think if the British had not wanted to partition India, after all, they had put Gandhi and Nehru and Patel and Azad and the rest in jail many times and nothing happened. All they needed was to put Jinnah in jail after the uh, direct action in Calcutta. He had given a call which turned bloody, isn't it? He was not held accountable. All they needed was to put some Muslim League leaders in the jail, and they had no experience of protesting British rule, you know. It would have died down. Or even if they, there, there had been uh, some sort of reaction, you had all the Congress cadres and the Sikhs to, to uh, confront that. You can say it could have been a civil war, not necessarily. All the all that was needed was to see to it that uh, the Muslim League leadership was put in jail and India was left united if the British wanted. No, this is important. The British army and uh, the colonial office decided a Pakistan armed with Islamic ideology would be their best bet to prevent the Soviet Union coming to South, to, to the subcontinent. You know, I, I don't know if I mentioned in my lecture, but from the 1830s, the great game had started much before they had captured the rest of India, that the Russians would come, would, would challenge their empire in the subcontinent. After Russia became a communist country, the threat of such uh, uh, a Soviet Union was even greater. So Pakistan was created to ensure that uh, the Soviet Union could not walk into the subcontinent. They had a theory that the caste system was so oppressive 
that the Hindus who were oppressed by the caste system would find communism very appealing. Uh, if you read my Jena book, this is quoted there, Sir Francis Tucker. This is his argument. And it, this must be an argument shared by other, uh, others in the British army and in the administration. Okay. So yeah, I so don't think this was inevitable at all. But we can say that had Jinnah not demanded the partition, mm -hmm. such a possibility with the Muslim League supporting it would not have existed. As an idea, it had existed all along. Mm -hmm. But as a political campaign, political movement supported by a party, it was Jinnah and the Muslim League who made it possible. Of course, RSS Hindu Masaba leaders I've also quoted, you know, mm -hmm. they wanted uh, the partition, but they didn't have the following because the Congress stood in the way and it wanted a united India. The British did not want to leave a united India under Nehru, saying that this would mean India aligning itself with the Soviet Union. Yes, That's it. That's how yes. you should understand it. Yes. Uh, nobody, has, nobody has been able to say it I mean, of course, Srila points it out. Let me be uh, respectful to him. He does. But I have given documents which are missing in his book, mm -hmm. where the actual memorandum of 12th May 1947 with its details are given as well. Okay. So Srila is the first one. Let's me, let me admit it. Then I uh, have given... Uh, uh, further uh, 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 primary sources in support of it. Uh, sir Francis yeah. Tucker's book is not mentioned in his. Mm -hmm. I quote him. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. And you have uh, quoted many other Jinnah letters also in your book, which yes. were not there earlier in, in yeah. public. Uh, as I have understood in the lecture, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was not in support of a separate state. Rather, he wanted provinces of a Muslim uh, majority. So the ultimate goal of Pakistan was not there, but it was representation of the minorities. Uh, no. What would you say about that? No, I don't, I don't think this is what I've said at all. Didn't I quote him saying over and over and over again that they did not want a decentralized uh, India, you know, they wanted a separate Pakistan with its own sovereign territory and the rest. So that's not my position at all. Mm -hmm. From where have you uh, uh, inferred that from my previous lecture and what I said today? Not in the least. Mm -hmm. I'm saying he was forced to accept the cabinet mission plan because were he not to do it, he was threatened that they'll have to leave India united as the Congress wanted. It's mm -hmm. only then that he accepted uh, loosely united India. That's what I've shown. Nobody else has ever done this. Mm -hmm. You must read my book. I, you have just acquired it. Na? You'll have to read it two, three times to, to, to grasp uh, the points I have brought forth. You know, This is a myth uh, circulated by Aisha Jalal and all. Mm -hmm. And in Aisha Jalal's book, not a single... I'm saying single speech, statement, hmm. or message of Jinnah. And there are hundreds, thousands, you know, saying that he wanted the power sharing deal is given. In fact, no speech is given either in, in support of wanting a power sharing deal or against it. I have said that there are all these speeches against a power sharing deal. Great. So we, we have forced to accept the mm. cabinet mission plan. That's what I'm saying. Mm. He so wanted he was... a partitioned India to create Pakistan. Mm. He never wavered on this at all, not even once. Mm. So please don't ascribe to me something which I have not said in your two lectures. Yeah. This Thank is you so much, sir. this is not yeah. the not at all the question. Uh, my I mean finding at all. Mm. And you have the book now in your hand. So one can't accuse me of saying that he wanted a power sharing deal in a loosely united India. No, the cabinet mission plan was of something he either accept or he or he, or they leave India to to Congress. Hmm. Okay. 
uh, so do you do you agree with uh, what Kenneth Craigie and Edgy Well says that uh, the partition should should be seen as inevitable and you know uh, and and in this kind of view of Craigie and Wells that the the blame of partition is placed squarely upon the separatist tendencies of the Muslim community and uh, this you can be seen you know as a part tendencies of the Congress you mean the the Muslim community according to uh, Kenneth Craigie and H C Wells uh, you know all of them mean nothing to me none of them have looked at the material the way I have. Hmm. And after my book, let Kenneth Craig and the rest come up with a critique of it. Hmm. Because if you don't look at the material in detail, then whatever you have said is worth looking at. But it becomes uh, uh, outdated once I have brought in all those facts which should be in the debate and in the discussion. Hmm. So don't tell me what Craig and the rest have been saying. My hmm. book is there. And if you want to challenge it, you are welcome. That I look forward to. None, none has done it because the way I've presented the facts, they stand on their own, uh, 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 you know, on their own without mm -hmm. the need for secondary sources. They are original sources, original speeches, statements saying we want India partitioned. We want Pakistan. We don't want any power sharing deal, no mm -hmm. loosely united India. And why he accepted the cabinet plan is because he was given an ultimatum and not something he, uh, in fact, I didn't say this, but immediately uh, after talking to the Muslim League Council, he says that we will do everything to get Pakistan. So accepting the cabinet mission plan is not abandoning the idea of Pakistan. So maybe we don't get it tomorrow, but we get mm. it because we'll work towards Pakistan. So it's 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 totally uh, uh, unacceptable to say Jena didn't want Pakistan and uh, he wanted a united India. Not in the least, not after yeah. my book gives all the evidence uh, uh, substantiating that he wanted the partitioned India to create Pakistan. And he got it from the British. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for that. And uh, we have some questions from the audience and yes. I'll, I'll read that out for you. The first question is that, could you talk a little bit about Sindh, where the non-Muslims could uh, got no land area at all, worse than Punjab or Bengal, as while uh, East Pakistan? You see, uh, this in the case of Sindh, about 29% of the population of Sindh was Hindu, okay? The question is why was not Sindh partitioned as Punjab and Bengal? This is the question, I would imagine. Because only Tharparkar district had a Hindu majority, slight Hindu majority. The Hindus of Sindh were spread all over the Sindh, Sindh interior. So unless you are in a majority, you can't claim that district or territory to be separated. And Tharparkar district, just one district of the whole of Sindh was too little. And the Muslim League, I'm told, convinced the Hindus of Tharparkar that they would treat them very well. So that's the reason, okay? And let uh, me tell you, the Sindhi Muslims did not attack the Hindu brethren the same way as it happened in the Punjab. It's only when Muslims from Bihar and the Urdu speaking belt came in the hundreds and thousands, and they needed houses and shops and so on, that the Hindus were then uh, hounded out of Sindh. So the, the Sindh situation is different from the situation in Punjab. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Deepinder Singh Kapani says, Sir, in res uh, retrospect, would it have been better for Shia and Ahmadiyya Muslims to have remained in India than to migrate to Pakistan? I don't know. Uh, what can I say? Uh, but they both, you know, the Shia conference in December 1945 rejected the demand for Pakistan. So the Shia conference is there. 
the Ahmadiyya were uh, uh, in in a very difficult situation. You know, the Ahmadiyyas were only a Punjab community. And their headquarters was in Kadian, which is in Batala district of, of East Punjab now. Okay. Suppose they had supported India and uh, Gurdaspur district as a whole had a Muslim majority of 1%. The uh, in the final Red Cliff Award, three tehsils of Gurdaspur district were given to India, which were on the east of uh, Ravi. And one tehsil, Sh Shakargad, was given to Pakistan because it was on the western. So it was close to the rest of the Muslim majority uh, uh, districts. Now, why were these three tehsils given to India? Because uh, Amritsar otherwise would jut out into Pakistan. It would have on its north Gurdaspur, Muslim majority, just 1%. On the north west Sialkot, in front of it, uh, it would be Gujranwala, then Shekhupura, and then Lahore. So Amritsar would be surrounded from all sides except the east. That is why it was already laid down by in the debarkation plan of Lord Wavell that Gurdaspur must remain with India. Okay. Now, the Ahmadis uh, uh, this was the dilemma they faced. If they opted for India and Gurdaspur as a whole was given to Pakistan, imagine what would happen to their community. Because they were all uh, uh, Punjab community. Most of them were in uh, in West Punjab. The same was true of the Christians of Punjab. Most of them were in West Punjab. So the Ahmadis, uh, in their writing, this ambivalence towards Pakistan is very clear. But in 1945, the leadership decided to vote for Pakistan. But remember, in 46 elections, it was still not clear if there will be a partition of Punjab and of India. But they played it safe and then they supported the Pakistan demand, no doubt. Because the fear was that suppose all this was to come to Pakistan and if they had uh, uh, betrayed the Pakistan cause as a minority whose beliefs were so questionable by the majority, they would be persecuted, all ends up. So about the about the Shias, yes. The Shia conference was an Urdu speaking sort of group. Mm -hmm. But the Shias of West, uh, Western Punjab, uh, West uh, Pakistan, mainly in Punjab and some in Sindh, mm -hmm. they thought that Jinnah was a Shia and so it will be a non sectarian state. Okay? Peace so they also Pakistan. supported the demand for Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And the Shias, by the way, only after the Iranian revolution, they have been in trouble. Otherwise, they are big landlords, they have been ministers, they have been uh, prime ministers and so on of Pakistan. The Shia problem begins after Iran gives the call for an Islamic revolution. Up until then, they were a privileged part of Pakistan. Hmm. The MDs got into trouble in 53 and later were declared non-Muslims. That's a different story. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that situation such clearly to, to our viewers and to us. Uh, last question from my side to you, Professor Ahmed is how as, as a political scientist, how do you see the legacy of partition? 
what is the legacy of partition the legacy of partition is the daily abuse i get from india on my videos even when i take a position uh in favor of hindus muslim sikhs living as brothers you know that's my position the training now in india is to hate all muslims they don't understand what i'm trying to say and so from there the hindu mind has now been poisoned so much in pakistan the whole ideology is based on the hindus being uh, somebody who would have oppressed us would have exploited us so on both sides i have to receive abuse for believing in a in a different type of subcontinent where all communities lived in amity and understanding so that's my experience and, but and really, really, when i go to india i get so much goodwill i even have met rss people who are quite reasonable to talk to but they you know the leaders are one thing but the the common cadres who i am told they even make some money every day by uh writing something hateful yes 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 this is true i didn't know that because some of these names i see every day calling me the worst side of sort of things and in pakistan they the right wing hates me for not being charmed by jena and so on and having a critical position but i don't mind somebody had to do this and i've done it i still believe in a united india the muslims would have five provinces in which they were in power they were over represented in the army they were over represented in the police and the congress party had no idea of creating a hindu rashtra that would have been the best situation for muslims i have traveled to india to the to srengapatnam and all wherever you go you have muslims and uh, to leave one third in india then was a betrayal of of muslims who are in india who can be accused of being a fifth column if you want to saying that if you wanted a pakistan for muslims what are you doing here and some hindus do use those arguments so has the partition really created peace between india and pakistan as jina said no it has created two hostile states armed with nuclear weapons spending a major portion of the scarce resources on uh, the arms race and this acts of terrorism which take place on both sides and the line of control where there are firing and so on and so on. so i think uh, the partition has not solved the hindu muslim problem if it existed it didn't exist among the people the people had their own wisdom of course the caste system hurt muslims let me tell you that this is something which may be for a hindu is difficult to understand but if you say we can't drink water from the same uh, glass as you do and you eat in a different plate then you are drawing a line which is hurtful and for the muslims to be fixated about everybody converting is a great threat to the hindus now at least the hindus have an 80% solid majority and they don't have to face Uh, you know this idea of an islamization of the whole subcontinent but that's a different story i say that the islamization and islamic extremism extremism is a part of the cold war the americans and the west armed muslims uh, uh, as a as a weapon against the soviet union but we are not discussing those things and uh, so let me stick to that so i i, I, I think A thousand years of living together would mean another thousand years of living together. Not mm-hmm. always embracing and loving one another, but learning to live as uh, people with different religions and castes and uh, and the bloody prejudices of this sort and that sort. After all, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs in the West tend to live in the same areas because there they face wise 
white racism mm-hmm. and uh, you will find punjabi hindus muslims and sikhs in one area gujarati hindus and uh, muslims in another area and uh, bengalis meeting and all of them watch uh, uh, bollywood films and enjoy <laughs> Uh, the same heroines and heroes and so on so there are different levels at which you join ranks you divide yourself i say that music and culture unites yes. and politics tends to divide. divide that's the problem yes and uh, in, in in conclusion of the session i would really urge everybody to get this book uh, you can see ah, raise it, yeah. yeah because before making any viewpoint of our past one must read as much as possible and this book and is available book in is india published by penguin, penguin viking penguin yes. viking india yes yeah it's available on amazon and flipkart on india uh, you can get it on that uh, we will publish the link in our youtube uh, video description so you can click on that after this video get the book read it and do share your reviews with karwan and with professor ahmed Uh, of how did you find the book and i hope uh, it is it is going to be a wonderful experience for you all with that hope of uh, peace and uh, more intellect about the past we uh, we thank our speaker professor ahmed for taking out taking so much time out of his schedule for doing this two part lecture uh, for karawan thank you so much sir my player i enjoy talking to your audience and to you thank you so much all the best thank you so much sir awesome.